In this lesson, we're going to be talking about why we are seeing an increased partisanship within Congress, within the votes in Congress. And this is a, a discussion that's quite difficult to really have when we're just talking in like this kind of presentation format, because I can refer to countless, countless examples of uh, partisan votes within Congress. Um, and that's what I'm going to do in this lesson. But it's going to be very difficult to, ex it's going to be quite short explaining the the, the the procedures and the mechanisms that of of the political mechanisms that are taking place that have led that's led to this um, decrease in productivity and increased partisanship. So what we're going to do is we're going to be discussing this new trend within Congress of increased partisanship, and by new trend we're talking within the last twenty or so years. So you know relatively new compared to uh, the history of Congress as a whole, effectively. So with that being said, we should start by looking at the what we call the traditional understanding of the party system within Congress. So they are described traditionally as having very similar positions on most of the issues, okay? And that and that really where they differ are on ideological issues. And we'll talk about that in a little minute. So, for example, uh, D.W. Brogan described political parties in Congress as being two bottles with different labels, both empty. Now, um, notwithstanding the, uh, the the quite cynical um, little jab at the end of that of that of that quote, um, the more important bit is the two bottles with different labels. So, effectively suggesting that they are uh, effectively one in the same when it comes to political ideas. Even as recently as the 90s, Mark Shields of the Washington Post remarked that as of today, the country basically has two Republican parties separated by the issue of abortion. Now, this leads, lends credibility to the view that the parties are both very similar in their ideological bents and that really it's only minor ideological issues that really separate the parties apart. And even that's, and this is something that has been... Um, uh, described as, as late as the 1990s. So more recently, however, we have seen an increased partisanship within Congress and the increased partisanship will um, hamper productivity. There are less uh, there are less members of Congress voting with the other party, with the opposite party. Votes in Congress are more likely to vote along party lines quite considerably. And this is because of the ideological center. So you've got the two sides of the political spectrum and the ideological center where you've got members of Congress that could be described as sort of floating voters that would vote on issues that are effectively swing votes. They're becoming more and more rare within Congress. So members who would describe themselves as a more of a conservative Democrat, uh, you know, a, a Joe Manchin kind of uh, figure, or someone who would consider themselves as a more libertarian um, GOP, somebody, uh, sorry, a liberal GOP, someone possibly like, I believe, Lisa Murkowski. These are becoming, or Mitt Romney as well, these are becoming um, increasingly more rare within the party. And there has also been a, generally a push within both of the political parties in Congress to increase the numbers of members that are on the fringes of the of the ideological spectrum. So not only have we seen a uh, a decrease in the number of members of Congress that are ideologically in the center of of the of the political debate, but also we have seen them pushing both to the far right and to the far left. And this can be seen uh, with the Tea Party uh, movement and the era of Trumpism, with a lot of a uh, new Trump, um, Trumpist politicians uh, that have been elected, the likes of Ted Cruz, for example, and we've got some uh, some more very very controversial figures um, within Congress. And there's also, in response to uh, Trumpist politics and the era of Trump. Um, groups like the Justice Democrats that have pushed to remove more of what we call establishment Democrats from Congress. So uh, Democrats that would be considered to be more on the, um, the more in the center, center Democrats, and push to more progressive Democrats. And this is, can be seen, you know, by the likes of Ilhan Omar, AOC, for example, and their replacement of 
um, more establishment candidates, something that we talked about in the last lesson. So when it comes to finding partisan problems in Congress, there are numerous examples of increased partisanship in Congress in recent years. And some of we have discussed some of these in the last lesson. So in the last 20 years, what we call party votes, which again I mentioned in the last lesson, votes that are um, effectively down party lines, where the vast majority of the Rep Democrats vote one way and the vast majority of the Republicans vote another, they have increased massively, these, these party votes. And we can see in this um, piece of data here, the source for this is in the description, the number of party unity votes has increased um, from the 2000s. So we've got the House and the Senate. If we're going to draw a general uh, line of best fit, we would draw it generally like round this kind of era here. So we're seeing an increase to the point now where in the, the late 2010s and early 2020s, we're seeing 16, 70% um, and up to 80% of the votes being party votes, partisan votes. Now, when it comes to recent partisan votes, we're going to look at 538. It was a very good um, source for finding partisan votes. And effectively, um, effectively, what we have here is a, a piece of, uh, was a page on 538 where we talk about where it talks about the votes in line with Trumpist politics, but it also gives us the number of votes on each side. So, for example, things like the March 11, 2020 vote on restricting President Trump from taking military action against Iran without congressional approval. Okay, the uh, don't worry about the oppose or approve bit. This is a this is relating to um, um, Trump's um, ideology with relation to it. But if we look at the votes here, we've got the House votes here, and we've got the Senate votes here, uh, 227 to 186 and 55 to 45. You can see they're very, very split almost entirely along party lines. And again, in 2020 as well, we've got the reversing uh, Department of Education regulation on student loans, um, 231 to 180 and 53 to 42. We're seeing a, you know, a split within the party. Now, these can be considered more like party votes, not because every single Democrat necessarily votes one way and every single Republican necessarily votes the other way, but that the significant proportion of Democrats and Republicans vote either way. Okay. So, despite the fact that we have seen a lot of um, partisan politics in Congress, in very, very recent times, okay, when we're talking about 2018 to 2020, and especially when it comes to um, decisions around, um, you know, policies around the coronavirus pandemic, we've seen uh, a lot more what we call bipartisanship, partisan where votes where that have broad support from both sides of the aisle on the political spectrum. So you've got things like the generally vague policy to provide assistance to people affected by coronavirus. This was passed in the House of Representatives uh, 363 to 40, which is a very bipartisan vote, and even more bipartisan in the Senate, um, passed on in March 2020, 90 to 8. And then we've got um, broad legislation to address the opioid crisis, 396 to 14 in the House and 99 to 1 in the Senate. I would like, I'm going to actually investigate to see who that uh, that one uh, vote against in the Senate was. But if you notice as well that these kind of votes here, and I'm going to link the website to uh, 538, which details all of the votes that have taken place under the Trump administration in the last four years. If we if you look at the very, very, very bipartisan votes, we can see that they're generally a little bit more vague because broad legislation to address the opioid crisis could mean a lot of different things, just like providing assistance to people affected by coronavirus. Now, it's important that as, as I'm recording this and as we're um, speaking now, we have got the issue of um, the... Um, of the Corona COVID nineteen, um, I think believe it's like one point seven trillion uh, relief package bill that is going through House of Congress right now, and this was controversial for the fact that the um, members are the Senate members in Georgia, uh, Warnock and Olsoff, um 
effectively won their races in January on the basis of that we're going to be providing um, two thousand dollar checks to um, to everybody in the United States, and this was reduced down to one thousand four hundred dollars with the explicit with the premise that six hundred has already been given before this um, passage and then we've got the issue of as of literally today as i'm recording and uploading this video we've got republican members meeting with president joe biden um, addressing how we can get this stimulus package through um so that people can um so that people can effectively you know have have this money and have this support so what's important to note is that Generally speaking, both of the parties ideologically have these broad um, goals. Things like um, trying to assist people with who have um, you know for coronavirus for the pandemic. However, the the specific policy details are very very um, difficult to reconcile between the two. So I'll keep you updated on how this is going to be um, going. And so really generally generally this lesson is difficult to teach in this kind of presentation format because it's very uh, data driven so there's numerous links in uh, to sources in the description where we can find congressional votes and you can take a look at different votes um, that have happened as recently as this week and last week that are um, partisan and bipartisan so if you ever get a question like this um, you can use really really quite up-to-date data and so in the next lesson, we're going to talk about, I believe we're going to be talking about the uh, concept of congressional oversight before we talk about the relationship between Congress and the other branches of government.